So I'm going to give y'all um, some phrases from time that all were developed in a year in U.S. history. And, and I want you to just throw out some guesses at the end of it of around what year you think these first came to this country. Okay, so the first is free throw. Next is motion picture. Traveler's checks. And frenemy. Who thinks it was after 1930? All of them, they're all the same year. Yeah. Nin who thinks it's after 1930? Okay, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> after 1910, you're wrong. I see some people in here who really should know the answer to this question because it was in the year 1891, the year that basketball began. Also, Thomas Edison's invention, the kinetoscope, which basically was this ability to take pictures and move them very quickly, making it a motion picture. And then the CEO of American Express was very irritated because whenever he would travel abroad, he, he had to bring like this note of credit from his bank in the U.S. and he didn't like that. And so traveler's checks were invented. But frenemy that one I'm really struggling with. And I did a lot of research, and the only thing I could find is that it came out of some newspaper in Norton, Kansas, and you can't even find the newspaper online anymore. When, I, when you think about the word frenemy, it, 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 this is how it's described in the dictionary, a person with whom one is friendly, despite a fundamental dislike. <laughs> a person who combines the characteristics of a friend and an enemy. And I started thinking about, we have a lot of frenemies that are famous throughout history. And I mean, here's a, here's a really old one, which would be Queen Elizabeth and, and Bloody Mary. Moving forward, if you were someone in the 80s, you know about this. That's Andre Agassi on the right and Pete Sampras on the left, and they were tennis stars. If you like comedy, you know Dwight Schrute and Jim Halpert of The Office. And then a little bit more modern day would be Iron Man and Captain America. What's interesting, if you do the research on the frenemies, is that they didn't necessarily like each other. They had some rivalry. There was something for which they found irritating, but they had to work together to achieve something. They, they were, whether it was because they were both tennis pros and they were working towards making sure that the sport was, looked good or they were making sure that the office was successful or that America was kept safe. When you consider the book of Ephesians that we're studying, there had to have been a frenemy situation going on because it's addressed so many times about their differences, particularly in the book of Ephesians, there is a difference between Jews and then those that, in the Greek, it's ethnos. In Latin, it's genus, and we know it as Gentile. And it just comes from the word genus, which just means a family. It's the predominant ethnic group there. It's the non Jew, between Jews and Gentiles. The city of Ephesus was, was bustling. It, for so many reasons, it had this amazing temple. If you've been there, you can see its ruins, the Temple of Artemis. Where it's located right on the coast, it would have been a hub for trade. It, was, it would have been a place where there was all different sorts of people visiting and staying. And, and you know how it is. If, if any city makes it to the top cities to visit or live in list, like Austin, then all sorts of people begin to visit and all sorts of people begin to stay. Ephesus was the most impressive and important city in Asia for the Roman Empire. It was a big deal, no surprise that the Apostle Paul spent so much time there. Ephesus would have been a home to a plethora of ethnicities. So you would have had Greeks, you would have had Roman citizens, you would have had Asians, and you would have had what we now call Middle Easterners. And the thing is, when you're surrounded with people who eat, dress, live, just do life differently, there is such possibility 
On the one hand, there is this amazing possibility for your worldview to be expanded, for you to realize, I had no idea how limited my view was, and wow, is the world so much bigger. But at the same time, there's this possibility and this ideal environment for conflict and for confusion. Unfortunately, what studies in science show us that when we are faced with people in a room who are different and people in a room who are the same, we choose same. We go towards that which is most like us. And then Jesus messed all of that up. On Christmas Eve, we hear that scripture every year, for to you, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. The gospel, this might be the thing that separates the Apostle Paul from from every other major disciple in the time and the reason that he wrote most of our New Testament is that he believed with utter conviction that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, was for all people. And so as he is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, it becomes apparent that there is still conflict going on. People are not doing this faith thing together well. And he today is going to give us the answer to what can bring about common ground. As we prepare to hear God's word, will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this warm place that we are here to gather, and we pray for those right now in our city and north of us who are so very cold. We ask that your spirit that, it was, that is within us would, would be the one that speaks, and that it would offer us a new way to live. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this is from the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. I'm actually going to read a couple of verses before this, so I'm going to put this down because I want to make sure you hear this part. So then, remember that at one time, you, Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you at one time were without Christ, aliens of the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us, abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both to God and one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came, And proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him... The whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul addresses the specific difference that this Ephesian church is dealing with head on. In verse 11, he he lets us know that there's a division between those that are circumcised and not circumcised. I want you to imagine you go to a church lunch after 11 o'clock worship, and the whole place is divided between Aggies and Longhorns. (laughs) And it stays that way. No one's sharing their jello. This is how it was. I want to make sure we understand this context here, friends. The difference 
that Paul is addressing is a difference of people, how they live out their faith. Specifically, this particular section of Ephesians is not just about how to be nice to people that are different than you. This is about being in relationship with people who are Christian like you, but do life differently. In my opinion, Christians have spent and are spending way too much of our time criticizing and judging other Christians. And I imagine that Paul had received word that there was conflict in Ephesus between two groups within this church, the Jews and the ethnos, the Gentiles. He reminds them that because of the sacrifice of Christ, those walls that divided us, walls where one brick could have been the law, Another brick could have been the prophets. Another brick could have been tradition. Those walls, they have been obliterated because of the blood of Christ. Because of Christ, those walls that should be making us hostile to one another, that should have conflict with one another, they are now gone. And this is what the text reads, for Christ is our peace. He has in his flesh made both into one, breaking down the dividing wall. The Greek word for broken down is the same word used in the Gospels when it describes an animal that is tied up and then released. An animal that is released to fulfill its purpose. You know, when the colt on Palm Sunday is released so that Jesus can then go on it, That's what was broken down. When we break down these walls of conflict and judgment between different Christian groups, it allows us to be better used for our purpose as a larger big C church. You see, we put up walls to help those inside feel comfortable and safe and secure and and protected. And yet, like an animal bound by ropes, Christians that live in this way with judgment and exclusion, we only are binding ourselves, not setting ourselves free. Four times in this section alone, and that doesn't even count the rest of the book of Ephesians, four times we are reminded of what allows for people that follow Christ differently to find common ground. Peace. In Greek, it is the word irene, and it it comes from the root word to join. Paul reveals throughout his letters that those who follow Christ have eternal life, and while that is so wonderful, for now, those who follow Christ actually have bonds, invisible bonds that can connect us to one another. The Holy Spirit does this thing and it unites us in crazy ways. Listen again to to these words. Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. For through him, both of us, all of us, have access to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are citizens together together the household of God. What if the peace of Christ is not the absence of war, the absence of hatred or violence or strife or anxiety? What if the peace of Christ means the creative possibility that people who are different, the people who really should not be getting along are mysteriously bound together finding their common ground because they are members of the household of God. How are we doing at being at peace with other Christians? This is particularly convicting for me, this text, especially when I think of the other Christian denominations who would not approve of a a woman in leadership or other denominations who are going to limit who is able to come and receive Communion, even others who use the Bible in ways that I perceive as harmful or hurtful or exclusive, do I just view them as enemy? Do we just view them as enemy? 
What if in this new year we could see that we must work together for the common good? We must let go of those bricks of bitterness and anger, of righteousness, those things that keep us tied up, keep us bound, so that we're not able to be in communion like frenemies, a person with whom we are friendly despite a fundamental dislike because we know that we are working towards the common purpose. My friend Lindsay, several years ago, I think probably 10 years ago by now, she decided to sign up for this pastor's group and they committed to be together for three years. And she knew going in that these people were gonna be different than her. And at the first meeting, she discovered they were very different. African Methodist Episcopal, Baptist, non-denominational, Lutheran, Methodist. She was the only Presbyterian. And oh my gosh, they were so different with age and stage and the way they viewed life. And, and we talked a lot about how difficult these meetings were and how much it was stretching her. And so 18 months in, the way this plan worked is that you took a trip to the Holy Land together. And so she goes on this trip and every day they're experiencing these amazing things and at night they would debrief. And she said she said very little. Because she had learned, you know, sometimes when she said things, she, she felt like they poked fun or jumped on her. Until she went to the Basilica of the Annunciation. I have not been there, but I've heard about it. And it is the specific church in Nazareth dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And all in the inside, y'all should go look online at the pictures. All on the inside is this amazing art all different forms of Mary in her different stages of life. And all on the outside of the basilica are these mosaics. And at the bottom, it'll tell you which country its perspective is from. So Croatia or Germany. And every one of them is this just provocative image of Mary and Jesus holding him as her son, and Lindsay is telling me the story that in that moment she had kind of kept life back in Atlanta out of the trip. And in that moment she just began to weep because she began to remember the grief that she was struggling with with her own son, who was having so many struggles back in the States and how this new connection with Mary, because there is several pictures of Mary at the foot of the cross. And to see Mary and Jesus as mother and son, it was this new thing for her. So that night, she's in her group and they're reflecting and she finally decides she's gonna share. And she shares with them how this was so particularly meaningful for her because her own son is crippled, 10 years old, crippled by anxiety to the point of harm. And she has done everything like every good parent would do that has resources. You know, she'd gotten the therapy, told the counselors at school, let the parents of the friends know all the things so that everybody, the whole church praying for him and nothing was working. And so she shared that burden with her group and several days later, they go to the wailing wall in Jerusalem and she waits her turn and they're all given a tiny little piece of paper and they can write a prayer on it. I don't know if if y'all have done this, if you've been, or a name and then When you go up, there's cracks all in the wall and you can put something in there. And so when she went forward, another member from her group, very, very different Christian than her, went up with her. And before he folded and put it into the wall, he faced it towards her and it had her son's name on it. And he folded it up and put inside. And and she's telling me this through tears because He could have put anything. And now tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people when they pray before that wall are gonna be praying for her son's anxiety. Oh friends, hear again what the Apostle Paul says. For Christ is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall, the hostility that is between us. May it be so in my life and in yours.